What if living unafraid could change your faith and prayer life? And what if facing your fears could help you see God in a new way? I want to welcome back my friend and sister in Christ, Grace Fox, and she has written about living unafraid. Grace, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me back, Nancy. So you wrote this book, Names of God, Living Unafraid. When you write, the fear is natural and God gives us an assignment. How do we often feel paralyzed by fear and insecurities? So when God gives us an assignment, like he did Moses, we often struggle with fear of inadequacy. And that's nothing unusual. I think people just do that. That's because we're afraid of failure and we're afraid of what people are going to think of us. But we don't have to let fear hold us captive. So when God gives us an assignment that feels overwhelming, that fear can actually be, I would call it a portal. It's a portal through which we can go in order to get to experience God in new ways. Because when we admit our fear and we say, yeah, I'm scared, but I'm going to do it anyway, because I'm trusting that if you've called me, you will equip me. Um, mm-hmm. God smiles and he says, okay, let's do this. That's that's how I walk with, with my Lord in experiences that he calls me into that just feels so big. Give me an example of like a fear you had when you heard him speaking into your heart about something and you couldn't, you know, what would you do? Oh boy, I have so many of those. And the I can think of one right off the top of my head where he called me to write. I, I sort of felt like there was something in me that was creative, that was crying to get out, but I didn't know what that was. My husband and I worked full time at a, a year round Christian camp at the time. And I thought, well, I am helping part-time in the craft shop, but it wasn't that. It was more. And so I thought maybe I could design a line of greeting cards. I found a lady who could draw, and I came up with the the cute little ideas, and we put these things together, came up with a few samples. I showed them to Dayspring, and they gave the polite, oh, it's not quite what we're looking for at this time, but thank you. And so I attended a writer's conference, my first one in 1999, the Florida Christian Writers Conference. And I I sat there and listened to what the editors were saying about writing for magazines. When I came back, all I could think of was, I could never do that because what if I failed? And what would people think of me if I wrote my thoughts down on paper and people actually read them? But there was one day, oh, Nancy, this is just so wild. One day when I was standing in the kitchen and I was frying chicken for supper and I heard a voice as as just as though someone was in the room beside me And that voice said, interview eraser. And I remember thinking, what? (laughs) I looked around and my husband was sitting at the table reading the newspaper and my kids were in the living room doing their homework. And I just thought, what was that? Did I hear God? So I said, God, if that was you, come again. And it was the same. It was just interview eraser. So I just turned off the fry pan and I went into my bedroom and I, I wrote in my journal, I think I just heard God. And he said, interview eraser. And so I said, if that's you, God, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about, but I will do it. I, I will do it because I know you'll help me. And so put the name in my hand. Who's this racer? And that was it. So by putting the name in my hand, I just meant make it that clear that I can't possibly misunderstand this. And the next day I went to my dentist. So that was back in the day when Christian Reader Magazine was still around. And I, he was a Christian dentist. He had a whole bunch of magazines on his coffee table. So I picked up this Christian Reader magazine and I was flipping through it, started reading it. And then they called me to the back. So I went in and they put the Novocaine in my mouth and and left me alone for a minute. So I'm laying there waiting for the freezing to take effect. I'm reading the magazine and holding the Christian Reader magazine in my hand as I see a little on this one page. There were like two columns with three little stories about celebrities and their faith. And one of them was Dee Dee John Rowe, the Iditarod dog sled racer who was a Christian woman. And at that moment, I looked at that and I thought, this is the name is in my hand. Oh my goodness, I know (laughs) what my assignment is. And that's how my writing career began. I did it, I did it afraid and uh, like terrified afraid. And when I got this article written, I submitted it to Power for Living. And that led to my becoming a Power for Living. It was a take home Sunday school paper. Uh, the Canadian contributor for 10 years. But, so, you know, when, when people struggle with fear from a God-given assignment, I just want to say it's okay to feel afraid, but it's okay to admit how you feel 
and to just put your hand in God's hand and say, lead me, I will follow you, I will trust you, and he will do it. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people get afraid because, you know, they think they hear something, but they're not sure and they don't know how to proceed. What would you say to them? Spend time in prayer. Spend time in fasting over this. Ask people to pray with you, godly, trusted friends who you know won't go, you think, what? You could never do that. You don't want those kinds of people coming alongside as your team members. You want people who say, wow, oh, okay, yep. If God is in this, then I want a piece of this and I will pray for you. Those are the kind of friends you want to pray for you. And don't rush into it, but step into it little by little. And if there's training involved in whatever it is you believe God's asking you to do, then take that training just one step at a time and trust God to open the doors before you. He doesn't mess with us. He's our heavenly father. And he wants the best for us. Yeah. And he, he does. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. So how, did, how does studying the names of God turn your prayer life upside down. You know, when I began thinking about what these names really mean, for instance, shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. That one is, they're all so meaningful. It's really hard to say that I have a favorite because they're so, all so good. But but when when I think about God being my shepherd and I bring a prayer concern to him, I just envision him wrapping his arms around me as a shepherd would wrap his arms around a lamb. It says in Isaiah that he holds us in his arms close to his heart. And, and that's how I envision him holding me when I've got this huge prayer concern that's ripping me apart. And I think that gives me comfort. That mm -hmm. gives me courage. And it makes me remember that you know God is not a God out there who is so far removed. He's left me to figure out life on my own. He wants to be actively involved in my life. That's what Yahweh is all about. Yahweh is creator and sustainer of the universe, but he wants to be involved with his creation. And so this Yahweh, Yahweh Roe, the Lord is my shepherd, is holding me in his arms. I can trust him in the midst of whatever it is I'm concerned about. Bring those concerns to him and and not be afraid. It's being close mm -hmm. to his heart is the best place to be. You say that Satan is devious, but not very smart. I, I Okay, I want to know about that. Back in the Garden of Eden, Satan messed with the names of God because um, when you read in Genesis 3 that he went to Eve and he tempted her, he said to her, did God really say these things? Did he really say you couldn't eat from that? And the, the name that he used there for God is, is the Hebrew word El. And that's the same name that's used in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But in Genesis chapter 2, you see Lord God. When it when there's more talk of his creation, it's Lord God. And that's Yahweh. That's the one that says he wants personal connection with his creation. But when Satan goes to Eve in chapter 3, he drops the Lord. He drops the Yahweh part, that mm -hmm. personal connection. And he goes back to just, did God really say that? And that's the God who created heaven and earth. He is the... Almighty God, uh, you know, all of all of that's true. But there's that personal connection that he stripped away. He used that on Eve. And I really believe that if he can put those same thoughts about God into our minds, mm -hmm. um, causing us to doubt God's intent toward us by stripping away that remembrance of personal connection with him, mm -hmm. then he wins. So he's using the same strategy. When he puts those thoughts, those in, you know, about God's intent toward us being, mm, he's holding out on us. He doesn't really have our best intent. He doesn't want us to have any fun, all that kind of stuff. When he puts those thoughts in our mind, he has stripped away that personal relationship part of who God is. You had a legalistic <laughs> upbringing and that influenced the way you saw God. And so when did that change? I think it's only been in the last decade or two that I've really begun to understand how Satan wants to heap shame on us. And even with religious upbringings, the same thing happens. I I was raised in a home, you know, godly parents, but oh, oh my goodness, there was a huge fear about what other people would think of us if, if we messed up and people mm -hmm. found out what did they think of us. And so religious rules. So I grew up in a home where we couldn't play with playing cards. Uno and Dutch Blitz and, you know, those things are all okay. 
but regular playing cards, there was something wrong with those. And dancing was totally taboo. So in fourth grade, I, uh, my PE class involved uh, square dancing for one season. And I had to have a note to the teacher to excuse me from PE class because square dancing was evil. And I, you know, fourth grader shouldn't be doing that. But my friends would ask me, well, why aren't you in PE? And I didn't know what to say. All I could say was it's against my religion because that's what I got. That's what I heard when, when I asked questions at home, that's all I got, it's against our religion. Mm -hmm. But I never understood, I never understood how shame and how we can start believing that if, if we don't meet up to these religious rules that are heaped on us, then there's something wrong with us and we are less spiritual and we don't have our act together. And if we don't have our act together, then how can we expect God to love us? And and then we go and mess up. And how can we assume he's going to forgive us? And maybe we shouldn't even ask him for forgiveness because is he really interested in, in that? Does he, maybe he doesn't even want us anymore because we've messed up so badly. And so, so we try to cloak ourselves in acts of self-righteousness. Then we can develop those self-righteous attitudes. And it just goes in a circle that never seems to end. But it's like he says, no, that's not how I want you to live. And the name of God that, that addresses that is Yahweh Sitkenu, which is the Lord is our righteousness. So mm. it's like, take off that dirty bathrobe of self-righteous acts and trying to earn favor with God and mm. prove that we're good enough. Take off that dirty, tattered bathrobe and throw it in the dumpster where it belongs and, and allow God to, to robe us in his righteousness, which is possible mm. through placing our faith in Jesus Christ. So the blood of Jesus Christ back to the garden of Eden where, you know, an animal was shed, the blood was shed so that God could wrap Adam and Eve in a robe that was worthy. Exactly. Well, you know, you, you say that you struggled also with guilt and shame. What's the difference between the two? <clears throat> shame, I think is just so destructive. It, it tells us that we're no good. We're no good. Guilt, I think um, we can think of that in negative terms as well. But mm -hmm. sometimes the Holy Spirit can use that in his favor when he when he prompts mm -hmm. us, when he gives us that little poke. And he says, you know what you said back there? That wasn't mm -hmm. the truth, was it? You mm -hmm. said that to impress that person. Maybe you need to go make that right. Mm -hmm. uh, that type of thing. And so, okay, okay, I don't want to live with that guilt. And so then we go and make it right. And, and then we can live with a clean conscience again. And so that's how I differentiate it. But shame is that thing that goes right to the core of who we are and says, you are nothing. You are no good. Who could mm -hmm. love you? Even God can't love you. That's that shame. But, you know, in scripture, in Psalm 34, it says that he removes our shame mm -hmm. and he removes all of our fears. And those who trust in him, mm -hmm. there's no shadow of shame on their faces. Such mm -hmm. a beautiful promise. Um, we have become self-dependent that we no longer believe we need God's help. And God invites us to tell him our needs. Do we confess our, our wants and needs? And what does it mean to fear the Lord? To fear the Lord, we need to understand that again, because, you know, again, aligning our thoughts with the truth, our thoughts about who God is need to be based on truth. And so uh, some folks might mistakenly think that the fear of the Lord is just being scared of him. But that's not what he wants. Again, go back to Yahweh. He wants relationship with us. And scripture says he invites us to boldly come before him with our needs and our requests. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the fear of the Lord in the negative sense um, would be scared of him. Mm -hmm. The fear of the Lord in the positive sense would be giving him the respect and the honor that he's due. It's like, mm -hmm. like getting to know him and the beauty of who he is until we are just overwhelmed with awe and wonder mm -hmm. at his character and the fact that he loves us so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord in that way is the beginning of wisdom. So becoming aware of who God is, walking in that truth, that's wisdom. Well, you know, you can find Grace's book, Names of God Living Unafraid, on her website, gracefox.com, and wherever books are sold and find her on social media, you know, as well. She's on Facebook. She's on Instagram. She's everywhere. Grace, what would you like to leave my audience with today? I want to encourage your audience that in this, it's, it's like the world's gone mad around us and we don't know where things are going to stop. I, I just, nobody knows. But in these uncertain times to, 
to go to the truth, to align your thoughts with the truth found in the Word of God. Explore who God is. Use the book. It's a Bible study. There's uh, a little QR code at the end of every chapter where they can get 15 minutes of additional video teaching. And so root and ground your thoughts about who God is in the truth, and that will start to meet you in that place where you are afraid. We all need that. What if trusting God with your deepest fears and needs could unlock a whole new level of peace and faith in your life? Thanks for joining. And if you like this interview, like and subscribe for more Christ-centered conversations and check out the website, thecallwithnancycevedo.com to find out more about our previous guests. Until next time, all glory and honor to King Jesus.